<clears throat> Today I'm going to talk about something that every one of us, I am certain, has had a problem with at some point in time, if not ongoing at the moment. And I'm sure many of us have, have had this issue, right? What we find that frequently we, we don't hold our tongue when anger arises, right? Y'all mastered that yet? Being able to hold your tongue when anger arises? What about being able to hold your tongue when that juicy bit of gossip is told to you and not to pass it on to the next one? What about holding it when you desire to criticize what's going on rather than to build up and encourage what's going on? You ever had that problem before? Or holding it uh, when that curse word desires to cross your lips, that word it ought never cross a Christian's lips. Right? Oh my, or oh me this morning, huh? We all need to work on this most powerful of foes, and that's our tongue. And you may think, Scott, this is a minor matter. Why are you talking about our speech and what we say? It's a little thing. Let's talk about those sins down there at the Capitol building that they're, they're doing. Or let's talk about them sins uh, of sexual immorality. Let's talk about these sins over here this morning. God doesn't care if I curse or gossip or respond rudely in anger. He doesn't care if my words build up others or tear others down. I'd ask you to look in your Bibles this morning in Matthew chapter 12. This is Jesus Christ speaking. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty clear instruction and judgment concerning that most unruly creature that is locked behind the white bars of your teeth, right? I mean, that's pretty clear, isn't it? He says every idle word, everything that comes out your mouth, God's going to judge in the day of judgment. God seems to be very concerned about what we say, doesn't he? Very concerned about the things which come out our mouth. And this book of James that we've been going through addresses this issue with the same straightforward, no-nonsense approach it has had on other topics. You'll remember James is reminding us all throughout this book that a Christian lives life differently than the world after receiving the gift of salvation. I had an individual just this morning on YouTube Attack me and call me a heretic over the sermon I preached last Sunday because I said, if you're a Christian, you're going to be a different person. Well, if you're really saved, God's going to change you. They said, no, 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 that's not true. All you got to do is believe and just continue on sinning like usual, I reckon. <laughs> God didn't make you into a new creature. Friends, there's a lot of people believing a lie that says that God doesn't change you. I read that it's a new creature I've become. Don't you? Don't you? A lot of people. We can't just read the Bible and then not apply that truth to our lives. This is the truest, I think, when it comes to the areas of our speech and what comes out of our mouth. Because the mouth, hear me now, the mouth is the surest way to get a look at someone's spirit. I can't see your spirit, can I? I can't look inside of you. But what comes out your mouth will tell me a great deal about you, doesn't it? <clears throat> it is the indicator. You will remember here that James is talking to his persecuted congregation that has had to spread out to other lands. And he's reminding them that they were called in these new environments to live as Christians. And he addresses the biggest talkers in the church uh, plant congregations first. And who does he address? He addresses the old preachers. Because we got a lot to say, right? Listen to what it says here in James chapter 3, verse 1. Verse 1. 
It says there, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So James points out a fact about being a teacher who was usually the pastor in the ancient church. They didn't have Sunday schools. They didn't have these other ideas. I mean, all of us can be a teacher in some regard, right? And, and teach to our families and different things. But he was, seems to be specifically speaking here to the one who teaches, the one who uses a lot of words. If you're going to be a man who uh, is going to have to use, have a lot of words coming out your mouth, Understand, that can be an issue for you. As words come out my mouth, different people hear different things. You understand? Different people have different ideas. That guy who called me a heretic online this morning, he heard something different in what I was trying to say, right, than the truth. But this is the idea. There's a lot of words that come out your mouth, and a lot of things are being heard differently. I remember a pastor a few years ago who looked out on his congregation, he expressed a, a kind word to a lady who was sitting there celebrating her birthday. He said, happy 30th birthday, sister so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, the lady replied, well, I just turned 25, actually. Ooh, yeah. That, that didn't work too well for him, did it? Obviously, too many words for that pastor, a simple happy birthday would do without his evaluation of how old she looked, right? I'm sure that didn't go over too well. For him. But that's the idea, you know. Now, that's one example of how sometimes those many words can get us into trouble. And there are many important things to consider, though, more importantly than, than just uh, insulting a congregant on their age. There's also the idea of, of being a Christian. Each and every one of us have words that come out of our mouths. And, and do you realize that when you claim the name Christian, that meant, that meant that everything that comes out your mouth, the people in the world, what do they see? That's coming out of Jesus' mouth. Right? Am I right or am I wrong? Amen. Oh, me. I, I, you know. It's true. Everything that comes out of your mouth, and they see you from down there at Omega Baptist Church where they say all them Christians are gathering, they're saying that's the same thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth because they don't know what comes out of Jesus' mouth. They don't pick up a Bible and read it. I hope you pick up a Bible and read it if you're sitting here in this congregation, but they don't pick up a Bible and read it. So when they hear words coming out your mouth, they think that's what Jesus said. Does that bother you? You know why every idle word is going to be judged in the day of judgment now, don't you? Right? You know why every idle word is going to be judged in the day of judgment now when you consider that truth. James is showing us this by giving us the example of a perfect person. He says the perfect person is someone who has a... You might think that a perfect person is somebody who has a perfect body, a perfect life, has all these perfect things. But James says perfection is found and truly controlled behind our lips. Behind our lips. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. You know I stumble a lot, so I must not be perfect, right? But, but that's the truth here. He says if anybody does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. God knows that if somebody can control their words, then they'll ultimately be able to control their entire body, control in, in their lives. Why? Because your tongue is that revelation of where your heart is. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 12. Verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bring forth good things. Good things coming out that mouth. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Right? Right? Pastor John MacArthur, he said this, he explained that this way. He said, when the heart is jammed full, as the phrase out of the abundance of the heart indicates, it is to have an oh, uh, it, it has to have an overflow valve, and the mouth is that valve. The mouth is the overflow valve to what is in the reservoir. So all that stuff that's ganging up in your heart, it comes out that mouth, doesn't it? And if you can't control the things in your heart, you ain't gonna be able to control this body, and you ain't gonna be able to control that mouth, right? What's in your reservoir? What's in your heart? James gives us an example of how 
much good or damage this tongue can accomplish and the importance of controlling them here in uh, verse 3. Let's follow along there in verse 3. Indeed, he says, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So, so it says here these two metaphors, two metaphors to give us the idea of how we can control our mouths. First is a bit in a horse. You've seen that. A horse has that thing in his mouth. He's got a bit there, and they pull it this way, and he goes to the left. You pull it this way, he'll go to the right. He don't always like to do that. Sometimes he, I rode some horses before. He liked to go to the left. I have to yank a little harder, right? You get an especially strong horse, you have a hard time with that bit. But as long as you've got that bit and you're turning his head in the right direction, he most usually will go the way you're pointing him. He's a powerful animal, but I've got that little tiny thing controlling it. And another example he uses here is a small rudder on a huge ship. Think about that. A giant ship, and there's this little tiny rudder, and it just turns just a little bit, and it makes that big old giant ship go in a different direction. What's all this illustrating? There's something small that is directing something huge, right? God is likening uh, it to our bodies, not just our bodies where they would go. Our tongues are directing our lives. Do you see that? Our tongues are giving direction to our lives and the direction they are going. And that's a pretty big thing, isn't it? A pretty big thing. Um, take the bit and pull it back when you're getting angry and it will change the direction of your life, right? If you were just to think about that time many years ago, you said that word that destroyed that relationship. If you had pulled that bit and turned that anger back, what would it have done? Think about that gossip that destroyed them people down the street that you were spreading. Think about it. Think about if you had just uh, turned the little rudder on your ship, it would have changed the course and made an entirely different life for somebody else because you didn't go ahead and spread gossip and lies about somebody that was passed down to you. Oh my goodness, the tongue is a powerful member, isn't it? A powerful one. God all wants all of us to mature in Him. Have you tested your tongue to see where your Christian maturity really lies at today? You know, there's a test. It's not like a test you take in a book. It's a test you've got to take in your heart and your mind and think about it a little bit. The tongue test asked ourselves if our mouths are more like Jesus' mouth than it was a year ago. Is the things coming out of your mouth sound more like Jesus in this Bible than it was a year ago? I'm going to let you all answer that question. We're not going to take it, take it up and grade it and, and give you any kind of a, a diploma for it or anything. I want you to think about that a little bit. Is your mouth different than it was a year ago? Does it sound more like Jesus or does it sound more like the old man you used to be before you come to Jesus? If not... Uh, don't you want that type of control in your life? Do you like riding a wild horse with no bit in the woods? I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like that a bit, would you? Do you like floating on the sea with no direction and no way to get to shore? Do you like that? And yet we never want to do anything about it, do we? We just pass it off, say, Oh, pastor, talking about them little, things, them little sins I don't have to worry about here today. These aren't little sins, my friend. The good news is that the Bible tells us that we can control our tongues by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us as Christians. We can do that because the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. He has made us a new creature with a new tongue that we can use, yet we keep going back to the old one. There are three ways we can start controlling our tongues today. First of all, write this down in the corner of your Bibles if you need to. Believe your words truly matter. Believe the words coming out of your mouth truly matter. How powerful are the words coming out of your word, mouth? Well, words can tear down or build up. As Proverbs 18.21 tells us, death and life are in the power of the tongue. There are certain people who live or die on your choice to uplift them or to discourage them. Did you hear me now? There are certain people who live off the words that come out your mouth. Say, I ain't nobody. There's somebody 
that cares about what comes out your mouth. Parents, parents, your child holds on to and remembers the words that you say about them. Many children will carry into adulthood a burden they shouldn't have to bear because some parent tore them down long ago. Y'all, y'all been there? I see the heads. Yeah. You still remember what that parent said to you, don't you? That, that harsh word they gave to you, maybe it wasn't true at all. Maybe they said, I'm sorry. But you still remember that, don't you? Words are powerful. Powerful. Children, children, you, parents might not say it, but they care if you respect them. For many of them, everything they have done for most of their lives has been about taking care of you. They at least expect you to acknowledge that or they fear they have failed. They hang on the words of their children just the same way as the parent does with the child and the child with the parent. Husbands and wives, your spouse has only one person in this world who's supposed to know them as intimately as you do. What comes out your mouth deeply affects them and they hold that. They hold that for, for years, if not forever. Oh, there's power in a tongue. Death and life. We must realize how important our speech is or we won't see any need to change it, my friend. And we'll continue to hurt people with that tongue and even hurt ourselves as we alienate peoples from around us. Number two, number two, evaluate your words. What is coming out my mouth? Some of y'all might not know what's coming out my mouth. Many of us aren't even aware that our speech is often negative. We need to think before we speak and pay attention to what we're saying and how we're saying it. Now think about this. Are most of the words that come out of your mouth complaining, critical, hurtful, disrespectful, or just generally pessimistic? What topics are you talking about? Are they always centered around yourself or what's wrong with others in the world? Or does your conversation include things about uh, love for God and love for others. What about the number of words you use? You know, the teacher in the verse before, uh, it said, is in danger because he uses so many words. Maybe sometimes we just need to hold back our tongues and just not say anything, right? Some of us don't realize how much trouble we get into when we let that motor run within our mouths. Are you giving other people a chance to talk? And listen to them when they speak. Now I know these questions are, 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 are hard to ask yourself. But if you don't realize the ferocity of that little beast caged behind those pearly whites, then you're not going to think about the need to tame him, are you? Amen. You're not. And we need to think about the need to tame him. And number three here, choose to change. God has given us the choice to put on the full armor of God. Everything within this Bible, there's a choice to it, isn't there? Even after you receive salvation, there's a choice to whether or not you're going to live more fully to God. There's different levels and ranges of rewards in heaven. That's based on the choices that you make. Being aware you have a problem isn't enough to fix the problem, is it? Being aware you have a problem isn't enough to fix the problem. We must intentionally put a muzzle on our mouth. Psalm 39.1 says this, I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. So you can sin with your tongue. We need to heed the advice of Job when he tells us in Job 13.5, Oh, that you would be silent and it would be your wisdom. Right? For some of us, we showed our lack of wisdom when we opened our mouths, didn't we? We have. Sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut. And if we don't make the decision to control these tongues, there's going to be consequences, consequences like you would not imagine that can occur. As James tells us in verse 5. Look here at verse 5. It says here, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. 
Let's tell it plainly here, James, right? Let's tell it plainly. James realizes what that little tongue can do. In whatever direction it goes, remember, it's for evil or it's for good. It will be like a forest fire once it's used. Y'all remember the Gatlinburg fires back in 2016? It burned so bad I could smell the fire all the way down here in Jefferson County. I could smell it, couldn't you? You know what that was? A little spark up in the woods. A little spark. And that little spark caught here. And that little spark caught there. And all of a sudden, uh, they, they like to tell us up there, they said, this wasn't the Gatlinburg fire. It was the Gatlinburg fires. Right? Because that one little spark spread. And that one little word in your mouth spreads, doesn't it? All over the place. This is important to know because if we say one small thing, it's bad. It can lead to a forest fire of bad things. Or if we say one small thing that's good, it can lead to a forest fire of good things too. Have you ever saw the devil get into a church? You know how he does it? With the tongue. Everything's going good, and then somebody will say one little word that offends somebody, and boom, it's burning. It's all over the place, isn't it? It's passing back and forth. That, build, uh, that builds and goes on the next person and the next uh, and continues. But that same thing that is bad can be said uh, from a pulpit or from down here in the congregation and it can spread about and a revival could take place within this whole area over one little word that's being spoken. Boy, I know what words I want to be speaking, don't you? doesn't have to be that way with the bad, though. We can put a muzzle on this monster. If we prioritize and control our tongue to speak the will of God, then it can be that forest fire for the will of God, which is essentially a revival. An encouraging word can run through a crowd and fill us with strength to fight the battles all around us. What a contrast in how we choose to communicate with our words. What fire are you kindling here today? The tongue has the power to destroy lives or accomplish the will of God. It can be a tongue of death used in the hand of Satan for gossip, slander, dissension, lustful words, and idle babbling. Or it can be a tongue of life used to preach the gospel, exhorting people to their highest call, encouraging people in their doubts, strengthening people when they're laying their foundation in the gospel. And, and God could advance the kingdom greatly with the words that come out of our mouths if we choose Amen. the right words. What words are going to be coming out of your mouth? Will you tame this unruly beast once and for all? James concludes here in verse 7. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So what's James saying here? Well, he's being kind of clear. Even when we realize our issues and make the choice to do something about it, no man, no person can tame the tongue. But let me tell you who can. Jesus. Amen. You ain't going to do it on your own. You can see the problems. You can acknowledge what needs to be done. But you're not going to do it unless the power of Jesus Christ is living within your heart. Okay? As old He-Man used to say, I have the power, but it ain't from grace, God. It's from God above, isn't it? That's the truth. James says what comes out of our mouth is a reflection of what's going on inside the heart. Who has the control within your heart? Who? Did Jesus take the wheel? Jesus take my tongue? Jesus use it for your glory? Is Jesus in your heart? Jesus said this about it. Matthew 7, 17 through 20. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree Bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. By what's coming out of them. 
Doesn't that sound a lot like James' metaphor? Does a spring send forth sp- uh, fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? What is Jesus and James talking about? He's saying that when it comes to your tongue, we're not talking about the extreme makeover of the tongue. We're talking about going and getting a replacement model for the tongue, all right? We're talking about a new tongue. We're talking about a new heart. We're talking about a new life. We're talking about a new creation in Christ, aren't we? That's what we're talking about. And if you're a new creation in Christ, the Lord God above has given you the ability to control that tongue. You say, I can't do it. Ask Jesus. Because no man can tame the tongue. No human can tame the tongue. But God can. God can. Do you get the point? Do you get the point? A Christian doesn't curse. A Christian doesn't gossip. A Christian doesn't tear down others. Like a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit. Like a fresh and bitter water don't come out of the same opening. Like a fig tree doesn't bear olives and a grapevine doesn't bear figs. There are nine fruit of the spirits, Galatians 5.22 tells us, was placed within our heart. Fruit that grows out of us. Love, joy, peace, kindness. Those are some of them. Gentleness. But that very last one, I, I, I always had this problem thinking... Surely he don't mean that. In the King James, it's temperance. It means having that ability to, 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 to balance yourself out. The idea of, as the New King James states, self-control. Say, Lord, I don't have it. I got all the fruits, but you didn't get that one in this model. No, no, I did, son. I've got it there. It's in you. You've got self-control. I promise you that. You've got self-control. You've got it. It's inside you. If my Holy Spirit is in your heart, it's inside you. You just have to activate it. You have to agree with it. You have to understand it. God promises that you have it. Trust Him. You are a new creation. Your tongues are part of that new creation, right? Live in that truth. Live in that truth. Don't let the old man you used to be get a hold of the tongue of the new man that God says you are. We have the ability to do this, church. We have the ability. Let's speak words of revival and not words of destruction. Let's lift things up as Jesus would do. Let's give God our tongues here this morning. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 1030 and I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.